in front of the camera. Okay, so thank you guys um, for inviting me. Um, so the backstory on um, this book is that when I started about seven years ago uh, to teach at San Jose State in the Human Factors Engineering Program, which is uh, one of the oldest actually in the United States, the program's almost 30 years old. Um, and having left a industry career of, of about 35 years at that point, I couldn't find a interaction design textbook that I really was fond of and that covered the methods that I had used and the teams that I had led, which were multi-hundred person teams at Oracle and SAP over decades to deal with very complicated stuff or what I was using as a methodology as a consultant. So I promised myself that after five years of teaching and abusing graduate students, we'd refine the pedagogy. If it worked, I would write a book. And so um, I'll explain why I call it UX magic in a minute, but I really want to dispute one of the inherent premises. And this quite honestly kind of comes out of Canada, maybe is attributed to Bill Buxton, who made it very, very, very popular um, to put an emphasis on sketching, the idea of visualizing and articulating ideas as a form of communication interaction design. And we were all taught that after you have all the requirements, so you've done your user research and you've figured out your personas, and you've got your journey map and you know what you wanna build, and now you have a blank sheet of paper, you should just start sketching. And probably for the first decade of my career, probably influenced by Bill and others, that's probably what I did and that's still what a lot of people do. And I'm really gonna tell you not to do that anymore that there actually is a much better, more effective uh, way to start when you go on this journey of trying to design a product um, or redesign an old product, a, a do-over project. So what is semantic interaction design? Well, it's basically a proven cognitive science-based approach um, to interaction design, uh, specifically the design part, not the full life cycle, um, that ensures maximum usability. And one of the things that's important is that it's more efficient, um, meaning you get stuff done faster and you can get better quality UX. And I make the claim in the book that this is an order of magnitude improvement over existing methods and I will stand by that to the grave. Um, and I'll give you some uh, case studies. There's more in the book, but I'll go through a few here. Now, I want to also note that the origin of semantic interaction design goes back a long time. You could trace it all the way back to Phyllis Reasoner at IBM Labs in 1979. And the notion of a task action grammar as human beings started to interact with computers, um, it was clearly recognized that we were having a conversation with an inanimate object, so to speak, and that language and how we held, handled language um, in that conversation was related to usability. And then there's um, more work in the 90s from Jim Foley, Professor Emeritus at um, George Tech, who actually has read the book <laughs> um, and has um, made a lot of interesting comments about it, but his design by levels work in the 90s, stages of action from Don Norman, um, Ben Schneiderman, um, who's also reading the book. Norman has already sent me emails about it, um, which were generally positive. Um, but other people have done work in this area on semantics. And e even if you go to a guy named David Collins in the 1990s, uh, he wrote a book called Object Oriented UX, which kind of in some ways is not scientific, but there is a foundation. In 2012, Jeff Johnson and Austin Henderson published Conceptual Models which is the core of semantic interaction design that only deals with about half of the first layer. And if I assume this is a pretty UX literate um, audience, so you know who Jeff Johnson is and probably Austin Henderson as well, but they were both part of the original Xerox Park team that invented the graphical user interface. Um, what I did in UX Magic was to try to turn this into a complete system, both methodology for design and a pedagogy for teaching. And so, as I noted earlier, the value prop is really simple. Faster, better. Um, and faster means fewer iterations, fewer meetings, less damage due to feature creep, and scientific-based trade-offs, not massive trial and error experiments. 
And by optimal designs, the underlying thing is design with the lowest cognitive load, which has the side effects generally of having the minimum number of screens and the shortest flows. Now, can I support the claim? <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you a few instances. When I took over UX for SAP, Global Head of Design, which is probably now 15 or 16 years ago, SAP had this really crummy CRM system that had thousands of screens. In one iteration, using the same back end, we were able to reduce it to hundreds of screens by just putting an HTML front end against the old back end. And in a second iteration, moving to the cloud, got it down to tens of screens, maybe 18, 19, and an iPad app, right? So this is a lot more than 10x. This was over 100x compression, though there was some functionality thrown out as product management allowed features to be removed in this version because no customer had ever used them in 25 or 30 years. Um, similarly, in more recent consulting activity for varying medical systems is a redesign of this almost horrible SAP looking like um, electronic medical record system, which barely had a UI, bunch of screens in the, some Microsoft UI technology that did puts and gets to a relational database. This was for managing radiation cancer treatment, had over 800 screens. The cloud version that shipped a couple years ago had 45 screens and about five that a doctor would really care to use during the day. Um, this is the landing page for a doctor with a modern swim lane uh, template archetype page with cards that represent different kinds of objects coming in and each column of objects is kind of a class of objects. Looking at a patient, you use a social pattern where you can see those same kind of Internet of Things cards, including patient reported results and lab tests and conversations. And then eventually you do get to something that looks like a patient chart with all their data. This looks like an improvement um, by the numbers, excuse me, I want to just move the screen here, of about 18x. But that really isn't the case because um, the new system handled radiation, chemo, surgery, and genomic medicine, and had a huge decision support system in it. So while this was an 18x improvement and just screen reduction alone, there was at least a doubling or tripling of functionality in this product compared to its predecessor. So now let me talk about when. UX magic is only uh, focused on the design execution part of the whole UCD life cycle. Of course, the other phases are important, but what used to happen was all the research would get done and then there was this magic moment when the creatives were given the brief and they went and they either drew on the back of napkins in the cafeteria or on whiteboards or you know whatever scrap paper they had and designs would just magically emerge. And of course, they didn't emerge from nowhere. They were based on people's a priori use of other products, maybe their understanding of current product, competitive product, et cetera. But it wasn't through any kind of formal synthesis of the uh, research phase output. Another reason that this is important is because design Darwinism simply doesn't work. And design Darwinism, just to define my terms carefully, is believing that A-B testing is a legitimate form of iteration when it's absolutely not. Um, you can't build a medical system this way. You can't build a large enterprise system this way. Um, you don't trial and error and see how many patients die. That's just not the way um, you do things, right? And in general, if all you're doing is A-B testing, and I have had some consumer industry clients um, where they would do this and they could move half a million people to a different version of a website and see what happened, um, you would get to a local maxima, but you never really get to the best design because quality is just not about eliminating defects. Quality has to be structurally from the beginning. So I'm gonna talk about how, and how I'm breaking into two parts, the theory, and then um, I'll talk about the practice. There are two cognitive science principles that I will talk about and they would work at four modular levels of um, interaction, similar to Foley's work 
in the 90s, but uh, where flow and visualization were separate layers, I've introduced grammar below and the optional use of game theory above. The science is going to be reduced to two statements for the presentation purposes. The first is that language is the basis of human conscious thought. Whenever you have to solve a problem, you solve it in a natural language, usually your mother tongue. Right? It's not that language is the basis of all conscious thought. Right? We have the fight and flight mechanism and things that occur in the primitive lizard brain. But if it's problem solving, it's going to be thought of and managed intellectually in the frontal cortex through the use of language. We also know in both um, linguistics and the psychology of computer programming that the grammar of any language um, will correlate with cognitive complexity. And we know that languages like Mandarin Chinese are harder to learn and master, and languages like English are somewhat easier, but still quite irregular. And Semitic languages like Hebrew and Arabic are actually the fastest for most people to learn because they have very few exceptions. Now, cognitive load can be measured in a usability lab, and given a lot of you are researchers, you probably know how to do it. And if not, we can talk about that in the Q&A. But what's new is I'm going to show you how you can actually predict cognitive load in advance before you draw a single screen. We start by defining grammar. And in a graphical user interface, grammar would be thought of as objects and actions. We would generally see actions as being in pull down or context menus. Objects are things we select and act on. They can be somewhat tangible, like in a canvas of a drawing program, or a little more theoretical. And objects always have a set of attributes. And this is basically the foundation that got us from command line interfaces to graphical interfaces back at Xerox Park. Now, when you look at the grammar, there is a correlation between consistency and cognitive load. The first word processors that I had the opportunity to redesign were in DOS, and they were horrible. I won't mention them, but they were acquired by a company I worked for. And they had, you know, you would perceive objects like a word or a paragraph or a document um, consistently from the analog world, but they had a lot of redundancy in command names, like cut for one kind of object and remove for another. And they'd have this very sparse matrix if you tried to plot out the grammar, and this is really bad. What we begin to see with the graphical user interface and cut, copy, paste, which we can attribute to Larry Tesla, who I'm sure most of you know passed away recently, um, we began to see symmetry, right, and much better consistency, not only within word processing types of solutions, but across entire operating systems. And this would be representing the perfect dense grammar where there's no exceptions, no redundancies, and no exclusions. Now, the math uh, between these two is quite different. So it really looks like this. I think we'd all agree on first observation that the dense grammar would have lower cognitive load than the sparse one. The math is a little more striking than that. So if you really had a perfectly dense matrix, you can approximate cognitive load as a scalar value as the number of actions plus the number of objects that people need to understand. As the matrix gets sparse and there's duplication um, and irregularities, cognitive load starts to grow exponentially. You can factor this as basically the number of actions times the number of objects. And you need to, um, you start to see this exponential growth um, at about 20% white space in, in the matrix. So there's a huge difference. So if you can figure out the conceptual model per the Johnson and uh, Henderson book and get it to be as tight as possible and then use that as the foundation before you even start sketching, um, it, that being the language now that you're going to communicate, you're going to be in much better shape. What does one of these look like in real life? Well, from that medical example, from 800 to 45 screens, this is the uh, conceptual model. It can be done, all of medical care for cancer treatment can be done with 10 objects and 10 actions. 
The objects are pretty straightforward. There's the patient, the medical record, and the treatment plan. A bunch of operational stuff like tasks and appointments. And then the care team, um, while they are people, um, are different than the patient. So there's sort of two different types of um, human actors in this that are treated differently. And you'd have the usual create and update. You do not have delete because you only void things in the medical product, and I'll talk about that later. And then you have a lot of workflow that can pretty much be um, pushed into actions like accept, reject, and delegate, and proof. So after a lot of work and iteration, um, we were able to basically get all of cancer treatment down to being able to understand these concepts. Now, if we look at this in practice, how would you do this? Well, we'll go back to the layers. Right? You have to work the grammar through all the different layers. So let's look at the grammar. Where do nouns come from? I mean, where do objects come from? Obviously, they're nouns in the natural language, actions or verbs. And any attribute value would be um, found in a natural language as an adjective. It's a little more complicated than that because once we've figured out our objects and actions, we do need to enumerate all the attributes and then we need to prioritize um, because not all object action pairs are of equal importance. I use a pet rescue nonprofit called Matchdog in the book as a case, hypothetical case study. The other case studies in the book are real, but I use this in class. And so if we were to look at the Humane Society type of site, we would have user stories. And for most people, you're working with Agile, but this would also work with the human factors task analysis or scenarios in a waterfall um, software development methodology. And if you look at the stories, real user stories, not engineering user stories, you would say as a parent, person object, I want to find action, a friendly attribute, dog object that will help teach my children object, person object again, to be responsible. As an elderly widow, person object, living alone, I want to adopt action, a dog object for my protection attribute. And so it can literally be as simple as taking the cumulative set of user stories, which define a, at least a release in software, if not the three or four year roadmap, and hunting for the objects and actions. In Dave Collins' object-oriented UI book from the 90s, he calls this foraging for objects. Now, you'll get a very sparse table, you figure out all the candidates, and then you do two things. Basically, you try to position attributes as, I'm sorry, position so, as many objects as possible as attributes of the smallest number of objects possible. And you try to reposition actions as state changes of, an, of another object. And eventually by crushing down the number of objects and actions to the smallest, by pivoting both to behave as attributes, you can get to a very tight grammar. You can go further than this, and I show examples in the book. Um, but this is something students can do in class in 30 minutes after foraging through multiple Humane Society sites. And again, in a matter of a, a very short time, seven or eight X improvement in cognitive load before you've started to even um, plan out your screens and your flows. Then you, of course, have to figure out all the attributes. And obviously an animal has a lot more attributes than this, but you include the species and the age, and most importantly, the dog's personality, because you're trying to match it to an owner, whether it's exercise friendly or kid friendly. But all the objects have sets of attributes. This also becomes your checklist for whether your screens are complete. It's pretty much, um, if you don't have the attribute, um, in the screen, it's not needed unless it's for some background algorithm. What's important about this pivot to maximize the number of attributes and minimize the number of objects and actions is attributes don't add significantly to cognitive load. Because when we're dealing with attributes in a graphical user interface, 99% of the time we're dealing with recognition, uh, human memory, not recall. So the load is much, much lower. 
And then, as I said, you have to prioritize because um, a task in the human factors world would be an object plus one or more actions, right? But they're just not of importance to the user or the business, right? The user has a few things they wanna do. So what you have to do is you have to prioritize in two dimensions. Um, frequency, how often people are gonna do it, and volume, how many. So uh, adopt a dog, and this is what you want, what not as the designer, not what you think people are gonna do. So donate might be theoretically um, or practically happening less frequently than you want, but you could still you would still make it a priority in your UI. But basically, um, what are most users going to do most of the time? And this better be on the first screen or no more than one click away. There are things that are done rarely by many people, like um, creating an account, and it's important that they do it or you lose them. But again, um, it's not going to be the main thing. And then I recommend for consumer products, either having a financial row or column, could be either, depends kind of on the business model, where you separate micro revenue from macro revenue, because these things in the consumer world compete often um, by putting advertising in space that would be better served by doing more for the user. This alone, and I teach this model to product managers as well, saves a ton of time and usually the first two or three iterations of screen mockups get thrown out because of discussions about priorities. So if you just understood the grammar part alone, there's three things you could apply today. One, actually reverse engineering existing products based on this heuristic evaluation method um, is valid, and I think it's kind of better than the standard um, taxonomy that we've used for decades from Jacob Nielsen, and with no disrespect to Jacob, I co-authored a book with him in the 80s. We're quite friendly. Um, but then you would look for the mismatch between the user's mental model in the mental model in the vernacular of Don Norman, the a priori mental model that people have, and the conceptual model that's being communicated by the UX. If you're gonna design a new product from scratch, well, this is clearly the place to start. And just do this step before you start to draw. Then you will have to draw eventually and do the prioritization activity. And most designers are in a world where they're doing some incremental evolution of an existing product. And in this case, basically they need to be focusing on any new features being added as attributes of the existing objects that are already in the product. And the intent here is basically slow the growth of cognitive load due to feature creep. Now a pop-up to layer two, just doing a time check here. Um, visualization. Visualization is actually one of the larger chapters in the book. It explodes into its own hierarchy, ranging from the raw components of graphical user interface through the page template archetypes into what I will call a design language um, and all the way up into the UX architecture world. And just to clarify what I mean, when I say components, we're talking raw GUI components, labels and buttons, assemble them into a grid and it starts to look like a calendar a little bit, add a few more controls and the ability to select and you have a date picker widget and eventually it can grow up into a full template that irrespective of whether it's Google Calendar or Outlook or the calendar in a medical record system, people recognize the archetype and have very specific expectations about it. So when you look at components, the original set of graphical user interface components were mostly uh, invented to show attribute values, like a radio button or a toggle button or checkbox only show an attribute value. And just a few components are used to show actions, and very rarely would any of them alone be used to represent an object. And so the main point is, as you're creating a design system, be very mindful of this, and you can probably wipe out 30% of my Xs and even tighten it up um, for a particular product or product family. Now an example here is, uh, of this is for a menu, here we have, a menu that's a menu of objects. 
the jobs page on LinkedIn. Here on that same page on LinkedIn, we can actually have a menu of actions, right? And these can coexist even within the same system because they do not visualize themselves in the same way. So this is a good example. A bad example is Yelp, right? Um, one of my favorites to pick on in class. So here we have the tab controls, right? Misused, but one tab is the inbox. The next tab would be a filter of showing sent messages. And here, the third, quote, tab control is actually an action. It's not being used as a filter. So this is a mistake. Um, and there's no one more authoritative uh, in speaking about tabs because I invented them and I have the patent, and the patent expired 20 years ago. That's how old this is, okay? But this is a screw up, and I'll show you some more on some of the other layers. Widgets, again, we have this bucket of widgets that are very common, like tables, and forms, and cards, and filter panels, and property sheets. And again, most of these, in the end, are starting to represent objects, some are still just a bunch of attributes, generally speaking. In this case, again, don't use trial and error and take some white out and erase at least half the X's here when you're creating a design system. But you need to be hyper consistent. Again, it doesn't have to be the same object that is in every list, but that a list is a list of objects, not a list of actions or a list of attributes. Here's an example, again, of a screw up. About six months before the book came out, the Google material team got wind of the book and the semantic interaction design approach. And they only really claimed to be a visual design system, not an interaction design system. And here's an example from their card control. We have a card representing the object of a cafe. Of a cafe and I was out this weekend and people are starting to eat outdoors in California, but I think the governor is going to shut all that down this week. And we have a local action at the bottom of the card, reserve. This is a transactional action. Basically, money changes hands. Here we have a card showing attributes, right? The weather in Hong Kong and a local action expand, but it's not grammar relevant. It's not transactional yet. These two actions have the same position same color, same font, same case. So to me, this is an interaction screw up because this is not an equivalent case. And we did use Google Material in that cancer treatment system. And we had to ignore a significant number of things that they claimed to be their standard because they would have killed the patient and the FDA would have looked at it and shut the product down. Now, the list of widgets that I showed you is um, not the full set of the universe of widgets because a lot of widgets aren't grammar relevant. Like a dialog box or toolbar, they take on the personality of the components that are in them, right? So their grammar is inherited by what's inside them. And things like zoom, pan, and scroll just move the viewport around. They don't actually do any transactional work. So I leave them out of the grammar as well. And then when we get to visualization of archetypes, the next level up in the food chain, we have about a dozen very standard page types that users today will have a priori understanding of, like what's a desktop, what's a portal, what's a menu, what's a shopping catalog, what's a social pattern for like Facebook or LinkedIn. And again, there are a variety of things that these page types can indicate and here you'd want to knock out about 70% of the X's um, and be very, very mindful again, when you're using that pattern, what is it being used for? Is it a container of objects or is it a container of attributes? And if we took apart Facebook, which has changed this, but this is an older screen, you can look at it very easily and deconstruct any page, right? We have some global actions. We have some local actions like adding a story joining a group. The objects in Facebook are basically people and, and threads, conversations. And then on the left, they have this messy panel with the same visualization pretty much. It's an icon and a label um, and not more information than that. 
Some things are objects, some are actions, some are attribute filters, and then a bunch more actions. So again, this is kind of a mess up, in my opinion, that's really unclear. And they keep trying to change this, and they keep um, making the same mistake over and over. Finally, I want to talk about language. And what I mean by language is not a visual language. It's basically about the consistency of behavior. And so here I'm going to give you just a little case study in the medical product where I'm going to show you a day in the life of an object and a day in the life of an action. So try and make this really concrete. Remind you very quickly, this was the conceptual model, the grammar for this um, cancer treatment system. So first we're going to look at the appointment object. If we start at the doctor's homepage with all the data cleaned up, and there's no HIPAA violations in any of this, these are all imaginary patients. Okay, we have an appointment for the doctor with Josephine Baker. The appointment sits in a card. You click on any card in the system that expands. That's actually part of the Google material design anyway. Here we have a combination of attributes. We have actually patient medical attributes as well as appointment attributes. Um, because in the context of doing the task, the doctor wants both. It may seem odd to be putting the cancer staging in the appointment, but this is a result of uh, over a year of user research. And particularly on the medical ver uh, mobile version, when the doctor's running down the hall and they want to run into the consult room two seconds before they see this patient who might be one of 30 patients a day, when they can just look at the appointment and get the medical update, they're really, really happy. There would be a local action menu, in this case, tailored to the persona of the doctor. The only action they would do frequently is either create a note for themselves with a sticky note behavior that I'm not gonna explain, but creating a task for somebody else on the care team. If you go to the calendar page, which the primary user would be the front desk, we have the same. We have um, the patient information and the card shows up and behaves more or less the same. But the local action menu in this case is tailored to the front desk person who's mostly going to be rescheduling and canceling and creating series of appointments. So very traditional front end. And they would see the whole clinic here. So this looks very, very empty, but they would have hundreds of appointments every day for multiple members to the care team that they're watching. And then if you were a nurse and you were bouncing through the patient chart um, before doing an encounter with the patient, again, here you'll have the whole patient, everything's about the patient, the appointment card is still there, there can be many, the patient specific information is moved to the header, it's actually a legal requirement um, that it be shown all the time, and the local action menu becomes the global action menu, is any action you take, on any object on behalf of Josephine um, is, can be done in this context. So now we've watched this kind of appointment object bounce around three different page archetype patterns, three different users, um, and behave pretty much consistently. Now let's watch the void action. As I noted before, in medical products, you don't delete data, you strike it out and then you hide it but it's always there for forensic purposes. And now I'm gonna pause and everybody but Keith can answer this question. Um, there's a medical error in this screen. This is the diagnosis screen, okay? What's wrong with this data? You don't need to be an MD to figure it out. I'll wait for an answer if somebody can come off mute. Is it prostate? Yep. Here we have what appears to be a female patient with prostate cancer. Now, being sensitive to the fact that if you had gender reassignment surgery, you would still have a prostate. It just happens to be in a very different location than its original location. But let's assume Erna did not have gender reassignment surgery. This is a medical error. Um, somebody scanned the wrong pathology report into Erna's file. So we would click on this and we would say void the diagnosis. It would be struck out and if the filter for voiding um, wasn't checked, of course, the screen would look like this. 
So um, drunken intern, you know, kicked out of medical school, error corrected. Now, if you click on the card, it will expand. And it's a very, cancer staging is very complicated with a lot of different numbers and letters. But the important thing to note here is that in here we were dealing with voiding a diagnosis. So void was a global action, but void also has to be a local action because if I make a mistake in the staging or I get a new pathology report, I would also strike out data from some of these screens and that would be necessary once I hit the save button. Until then, I can keep changing the values. So um, I'm not talking about it in this presentation, but there's a quite a lot in the book about the difference between local and global actions and how they, you have to often move between them and behave consistently. So let's move on. Um, very quickly, documents, right? Yes, if somebody is, scans in um, or attaches the wrong report for a different patient, it has to be voided you would have the same behavior in the list pattern. In the journal notes, which is free form text, if somebody types something and it's accidentally not intended or they made a mistake or they were thinking about a different patient and didn't realize they were on a screen, they would have to void out. And once they voided out their comment, they would have to retype it if they accidentally hit void. There is no undo for a void feature. That would also um, have the FDA slam you pretty hard. So we can see again, this void action has to be very consistent. And finally, at the architecture level, there are five mostly um, common, there are more than this actually, but these five patterns account for most interaction and in some, in some sense information architecture of organizations. Think of a box equaling a screen in this case, and the screen holding one or more um, important objects, sequential like a shopping cart, hierarchical, which we see every day on the web, hub and spoke, often with a portal or a dashboard in the middle, the matrix where you can go from any screen to any other screen, but you're always transiting through screens to get to where you wanna be, and the network where you can go from any object screen to any other in any order at any time. Um, <clears throat> These last two are really most often seen in heavy duty professional um, applications. And if you looked at every one of these architectures, and this has been well documented, um, and this is kind of referenced in the book, there's about eight human factors characteristics from location awareness to task speed. And they all you know, are good or bad, better or worse, um, in any of these characteristics. But the thing that I caused me to put this in the book is that architectures and grammar interact. In the medical product that I showed you, we looked at hierarchical hub and spoke and network. Um, and we actually did slightly different grammar variations to see how we would have to position things if we chose to organize the content um, and the interaction in these different patterns. So while I'm kind of explaining from the bottom up the different levels, actually you tend in real practice to be at the bottom level and the top and looking at the grammar and actually the architecture and figuring out what you wanna do. And actually from all the screens that I've shown you, you can't tell what architecture um, that those screens were in. That's how modular this um, five layer system actually is. Now, who understands all these patterns of widgets and archetypes and um, languages and architectures? Well, actually five billion people do. Those of us who are academics are now basically teaching fish how to swim, right? As we're trying to teach user experience, we've got all these digital natives that, um, you know, they came knowing this stuff's probably in utero, right? But because of the penetration of smartphones and the internet, Really, almost any new digital artifact is going to be approached by 5 billion people with some preconceived notion of whether it represents an object or an action um, or a collection of attributes. And interestingly, the other 2.7 billion people, um, whether they can 
uh, read or write can only approach the digital world and participation in HCI by mapping physical world metaphors of objects and actions onto what they see on the screen. Um, it's really the only way that you can teach them um, as well if you're an instructor. And for most of us, you know, that first five billion is the digital economy right now. So from a practical standpoint, um, I'm certainly not saying ignore the other 2.7 billion, but um, this is our day-to-day -day bread and butter. Hmm. Now I'm gonna quickly touch on flow, and I will be certainly done at the top of the hour with the, other, the rest of this. Um, flow is about minimizing the number of steps across screens. This is actually somewhat complicated topic, but it's pretty easy to understand at a high level. Actions propel objects through the flow. If we go back to the dog um, nonprofit, adoption nonprofit, we had these objects, the dog, the owner, the organization, and money. And if we looked at the donate flow, and we used Jesse James Garrett's uh, decades old uh, use of boxes and arrows, um, objects will be boxes and lines will represent actions, the donate flow would be very simple. Homepage, donate button, call to action, a thank you screen, route the user somewhere, maybe take a detour to see if they'll volunteer, because time and money are actually equivalent, right? And we'd see basically every line is some action in the grammar and every screen, in this case, three different objects are involved, right? Um, the people, the organization, money, again, the organization. So actions are propelling the objects through the flow. And obviously the fewest actions and the fewest number of objects that can represent the entire functional scope, the shorter all the flows are gonna be. And lastly, game theory. This is actually a long chapter, but I'm gonna cover it in just a couple of short minutes. The question with game theory is can you motivate and guide human behavior? Can you intentionally manipulate people? And what are you really doing if you're manipulating people? Well, you're causing them to favor some combination of objects and actions, which as I noted previously in the human factors parlance would be to favor specific tasks over others. In the world of game theory, when we apply it to interaction design, there are three flavors. Um, that I cover in the book. Gamification, which is the addition of reward elements to incentivize work. Gameful design, where it is the substitution of a game as a proxy for a transactional task. So this is a little hard to imagine, but think of a screen that looks like Tetris, but when you're done with it, you've completed your expense report and sent it to your boss to be approved. And then Captology, this is the work of BJ Fogg uh, in persuasion, stands for Computers as Persuasive Technology, um, where we're um, trying to get people to change their behavior. And all three of these, we're trying to minimize cognitive load. In the world of pure games, we are not. We're actually trying to raise cognitive load. So you can't just directly um, take everything out of the game world and start throwing it at um, real working software. The mapping in UX Magic actually is quite straightforward. What you're doing in gamification is you're incentivizing actions. What you're doing in the gameful design is in Sebastian Detterding's research and thousand page volume on the gameful world, is you're, you're basically doing an object substitution. The game pieces in Tetris, the little squares basically represent money in the expense report. And Captology, you're basically manipulating attributes. All of this little, uh, you know, original list price was a million dollars, but you can have it for $20 or only three left in the warehouse when the warehouse is full of them. You are manipulating attributes associated with the object to be purchased. Um, and generally speaking, you're lying. The warehouse is full of all those things. You're not getting a deal, I assure you. Obviously with game theory, we're trying to either increase or decrease some human behavior. Uh, in the enterprise world, we're generally trying to increase productivity and performance. Um, in the medical world, we're trying to decrease medical errors, patient errors, and um, unsafe behavior, like consuming too many carbohydrates if you're diabetic. 
et cetera. So we're trying to incentivize some combination of actions and objects to behave uh, either up or down. We are applying them against intrinsic or extrinsic behaviors. And as this is a uh, Chi chapter meeting, I don't really need to explain the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic uh, human motivators. Um, and when you get into the world of game design and gamification, um, then you basically have um, these motivators and you're targeting just a couple with something called game mechanics. And a game mechanic is basically a combination from the previous chapters of an archetype um, and a flow. So narrative might you know, kind of use the social pattern. Um, feedback can use a social pattern. And there's different flows. Privilege, reciprocity, um, again, may use uh, recognition. We'll use dashboards, which is an archetype pattern. And it's basically focusing on competition as a motivator. This screen happens to be the Nissan Leaf owner's portal, which I think is brilliantly done from a gamification standpoint. And I show it, if anybody knows um, who the designers were, I'd love to meet them. But this is a social game where the cars, you kind of uh, grow trees as you drive, and you have people in different continents competing against each other to see who could um, get the highest carbon offset. So uh, social games are generally the most productive in the enterprise, but it works here quite well too. This is all around you. Um, game theory, you might not think of Facebook as a game, but this is a legally acquired slide showing their gamification model, where they're intentionally introducing social pressure, unpredictability, and scarcity. And every one of these uh, mechanics that they're using, like social treasure, again, is a combination of an archetype and a flow that you will find in UX magic. Not to be so totally negative on uh, game design, though the Nissan Leaf, I think, was a great one for good. Um, these are screens from the Blue Star Diabetes Solution, which I believe is available in Canada now, as well as the United States and it went through clinical trials. This is the first instance of digital medicine. This in the United States is FDA class two approved and is legally adjudicated as a pharmaceutical. It has an FDA drug code, even though it's a software only solution for high risk type two diabetics. And in clinical trials in the US and Canada, it has been shown to reduce the average A1C blood glucose level of a high risk type two diabetic by about two points which is better than metformin, which is the leading pharmaceutical, which is about 1.8. And here, again, you will see elements of um, game theory, right? There are quests, and there are challenges, and there are medals. And there's a ton of captology, but it's all about keeping um, the patient um, on the right diet, right exercise, mindfulness exercises, taking their meds correctly, um, and participating in a virtual community, all of which can outperform a medication. So you can use all this game theory for good. And that's really the end of the preview, and we're right at the top of the hour. So I've basically kind of given you the overview. The book, oh, caveat, again, don't forget the other UCD method steps, but UX magic is about becoming a Jedi in this design area, faster, better. There's more to the book. Um, I'll comment just briefly. There's a chapter, every chapter has a one word name. Yes, the chapters really are grammar, visualization, flow, and game. Uh, there's one called Elegance, which is about pure graphic design. Because even if you do all this stuff well, just with straightforward, regular graphic design, you can still screw up. Um, and so most people don't really understand the basics and it's not that hard. Myth deals with UI style guides and design systems and when to ignore them because most of them um, are not as helpful as people think. And then chess, which is kind of my view of the future of both UX design and um, the design profession. So you can get the book. It's on Amazon in paperback, Kindle, 
It's not a small book. It's about 350 pages um, full color. Lots and lots of examples. And there are exercises. The publisher is the Interaction Design Foundation. And so if you're going to use it for teaching or for your own, um, there are study exercises that you can do along with the book. Two caveats. For individuals, um, if you guys would like me to repeat this for another company or another group of people, as long as the shelter in place order is happening, I'm doing about one of these a day, and I've been doing it for a lot of really interesting teams all over the world, um, including some of the national labs and the guys who designed the Mars rover, um, who I didn't know had a UX team, but kind of makes sense that they do. Um, and also there's, you know, so post on social media, tell your colleagues, um, I'm getting uh, like the secondary and tertiary referrals now. I think I'm doing this probably because Keith referred me to you guys or somebody else referred me. Um, and for UX leaders and managers, I actually have the material on how semantic interaction design applies, oops, to both data viz and information architecture. They're kind of orthogonal topics, but they're all about semantics. These are not independent things. They kind of all lock together. Um, and I can even explain that if you're interested a little bit in the Q&A. But I did not put that in the book. It would have been 700 pages. And I just, um, my wife was getting angry because it took me 14 months to write the book with no um, income other than my paltry adjunct professor income. So uh, I had to stop at some point. And that's it. So now I'm open to uh, Q&A. So, Paul, how do you want to handle the Q&A? Do you want to get people sure, to yeah, unmute? Yeah, I was going to propose that people could just unmute themselves if they want to ask a question or if they didn't feel inclined, they could uh, post in the chat and I'll keep an eye on the chat. And if I see anything in there, I'll, I'll ask it. So, yeah, please okay. do. Yeah, and uh, Dan, thank you very much for the talk. It was very uh, inspirational and covered a lot of ground. And brought was a lot brought of ground. back some of them. Uh, can we get those slides? Dan, Daniel, can we get slides from you? Sure, I'll, I'll send them to Paul. Great, we'll add them to the event. Mm. So I saw somebody in the chat say they're gonna apply this to IBM Analytics. I actually did this for um, one of IBM's largest analytic uh, teams, the Cloud Data and AI under Eric Balmick. Uh, Jamie's from, from that group local in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and they, they actually did a talk for us at Torquay as well, um, and unfortunately, he had to go and okay. <laughs> have dinner with family. Okay, so maybe yeah. Jamie's seen it twice. Okay, but anyway, yeah, go ahead, shoot with the questions. Um, um, I have a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I started, um, I saw your um, talk on IXD8 on like I, I looked up the um the talk like I saw the matrix season the stuff uh, and so before buying the book I saw that you have a one-hour video so I started applying this to what I'm working on uh, right now um, I have a couple of questions uh, in terms of the matrix of objects and actions I also found that the complexity would be increased by I actually created a matrix that was objects against objects like objects on the x-axis objects on the y and then the one-to-one -one and many to one mm -hmm to many relationships between those objects, realizing that as a starting point, that would also increase complexity probably by a multiplier as well. So that's part of my question, if you factor that in um, as well. And then the other question was, if you have um, objects versus attributes, and it's, this, sorry, objects and actions, but it's the same action, it's just called, the label is different depending on what object it is, but it's like, Cut, cut of one object is would be called I don't know remove another object but you can't get around it because of the of the legalese or the terminology of the of your users does that mean that the complexity is 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 a little is is still increased even though it's just the label that's changing but the action yes. really is figuratively the same yeah hmm. absolutely so let me um, there's like three or four questions and comments there so I'm glad um, you're trying to apply the method. <clears throat> So I'll take them um, kind of backwards. Yeah, 
the ver by virtue of the fact, something as simple as that the label is different, but the action is the same, you are increasing cognitive load because now I'm having to understand the exception and the rules where otherwise it would have been predictable. With regard to objects, uh, in the book, I discuss this as the kind of object attribute duality, right? Objects do have relationships to other objects. And, um, right, so the appointment object is carrying attributes of the appointment and attributes of the patient. And actually it's carrying some attributes of the doctor as well. Um, and I would say one, one of the first things I'm gonna do if we uh, do a new version of the book is get more explicit about this because most people understand objects have one-to-one, -one, one to many, many to many relationships. Um, you guys all probably all do, but students don't, inher it's not inherent to them that there are these data dimensions. And that's what the object-oriented UI methodology also focuses very heavily on. But where it has a tendency to be problematic is it's too close to the relational database model, right? So it tends to be the objects of the system, not the objects of the process that users are trying to um, conceptually get their work through. But yeah, I, um, you, you basically pivot objects, but you definitely have this duality. And it's the hardest thing to learn about the method, right? Is that, you know, the dog is an, the dog is an attribute of the adoption, right? It's going to take a dog and a person, a dog object and a person object, right? Or you, you can't pull it off. Right. Okay. So other questions? There's one in chat. Do you want to, Veronica, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, sure. Um, I was just wondering um, if you could talk a bit more about the cognitive load measurement that you brought up kind of earlier on, especially because you presented that kind of calculation of the objects times actions being like this proxy for cognitive load. But I was wondering if there's more for it, more to that, especially if you're like trying to do like, I don't know, a research project where you're actually like measuring it. Sure. There are competing metrics for cognitive load um, in the human factors literature. And without kind of going down that, you can look, um, the one that most people would use is NASA's TLX measure, which deals with um, when people saturate, and they, I mean, but they are also often studying astronauts, so these are really smart people with a lot of capacity. Um, I think the major thing from a practical standpoint is what direction are things going? And in the lab, it turns out that there are, a number of, art of um, journal articles that have been published that have shown that pupil diameter is a proxy for cognitive load. And I don't want to say off the top of my head um, if diameter going up, uh, widening is going up or down. I, um, but if you have a simple eye tracker, actually, without even studying what people are looking at, um, again, you can see and you can compare two different designs, if you have two different grammars and two different sets of screens, even, and try and correlate in the lab. But again, you really want to know what direction you're going. Um, the actual values, and from a practical standpoint, I haven't found that useful, right? It's just, are you, are you reducing it? Or are you increasing it? Thanks so much. We have no questions. Paul, I think you're on mute if you're talking. Sorry, I keep turning it on and off and I can't recall if, if I'm on or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just going to uh, make a last call for questions and if there aren't any further questions, we, people who want to stick around, uh, we can just stick around and uh, chat more informally if, if uh, people who are inclined that way. Some of us uh, usually do, so you're welcome to stick around. So last call for questions, anybody? Yeah, I've got one. Okay, except for Keith. Anybody except for Keith? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Keith. Uh, I learned about jobs to be done last yes. week, and I'm trying to figure out is it is it legit or is it just new, <laughs> a, a new a new word for what we've already been doing? Maybe that's a that, discussion. 
for later on. Right. That, yeah. so that I think so. I'd be happy to participate. That can be a discussion for everybody. I have just finished literally two days ago, Jim Kalbach's right. yeah. new book on jobs to be done. It's not the first book. And um, Jim wrote a column for me in Interactions Magazine, my Business of UX forum, uh, about the, the differences um, between design thinking and jobs to be done. And I thought it was a good column, but I didn't really understand it until I read his whole book. And it's a long book. That it, to him, it's, um, it's method, religion, and practice. Um, I think that it has a lot of merit in some places, and I have companies I've worked with, particularly um, in enterprise and medical, where they use it, but it's more of a product management technique. It's not a design technique. But it is much more informative, in my opinion. It can be more informative, if done right, uh, in terms of what you have to do as a designer to actually make a functional system meet people's needs. So I'm kind of in favor of it, um, but I've only um, had to, I've only been involved with teams used it uh, a few times, and I've never had to lead it as a methodology. I don't know, have you? No, no, I've, I've just sort of heard it mentioned and, you know, read the articles that were either religiously for it or against it. Um, but I haven't actually uh, read mm -hmm. Jim's book or gone into the details to see what was really there. So an interesting twist on this, and I'll go out on a limb here, um, is if you compare it to the central point of design thinking, which is all about empathy, okay, um, for the most part, um, and empathy-driven personas, they're often not actionable. And there are people in the UX field, this is not my unique idea, who actually believe that empathy is a form of racism, right? I can never really know what it's like to be a black person, okay? I can tell you what racism looks like, though, growing up in an Orthodox Jewish family in the Bible Belt and getting thrown off the high school football team for missing practice on uh, Rosh Hashanah and Jewish high holidays, okay? So what is, you know, jobs to be done takes all of that out, right? It's all the context of what do people do, what are they paying you to deliver, right? And it takes all of that noise out of, um, you know, the design thinking process. So good or bad, I don't know. Jerry's still out. Great, thanks. Good, that's a great answer, thanks. So maybe on that note, I'll stop the recording.